For Prima Media's policy, I'm Sashni Madli. Joining me today is columnist and author Haji Mohammed Daji, here to discuss her book, Here's the Thing, a collection of thought-provoking and hilarious essays. So you open your book with an extremely emotional letter to your father, um, and I think it can almost be summed up with one of the sentences that you write in that first chapter. And then he was there and you were not. Can you just tell our viewers why you wanted to start up your book with this moving letter? Um, I think it was intentional to put, the, to put that essay in, in the front. Um, oh, such a hard question though, because I think to an extent loosely, I think I just wanted to get it out the way, you know? Um, I wanted to have that, that story be told. Um, I knew that interpersonal relationships and familial relationships are a difficult thing for many people to navigate. But I also knew that the book wasn't going to be sorry, not sorry. It was going to be, it was going to be sort of less hard politically. And it was just going to be this lost and found burden of what it means to be human. Um, and I wanted to, I think, grief and sorrow and illness and you know these themes pop up elsewhere but I think I wanted to lay the foundation of the bulk of the, the um, sensitivity so to speak out in in the front of of the book and I also think it's like I say with familial relationships I think I my hope is that many readers will find comfort or catharsis or or meaning in it as well and you go into state that your book uh, breaks the barriers of society's expectation of my politics, my pride, and my perspective. Can you just briefly unpack that for us? It, it literally is just a book of writing exactly what I wanted to write about. You know, I wasn't keen on, on writing on the themes that I do love to write about and I'm passionate about um, as, as a Black woman but that we often feel so um, restricted by, you know, so boxed in by, like we always have to be angry about something political, right on gender-based violence, or right on racial topics. And um, it always has to be really, really serious. And I think I just wanted to not do that. You know, I mean, of, of course I do, and there are some essays that, that do speak to that. But I think for the most part, I just wanted to, invite people into a world of black women that is more varied and has more diversification in our interests and who we are as people and our humor and our cultures and um, you know how it feels to be complicated not just as a black woman but as a human being um, yeah so that that's what I was trying to do I guess <laughs> Um, and you did face criticism for a piece you wrote about gang violence uh, on the Cape Flats. Can you tell us about how you reflected on this experience and your arguments that, yes, I belong to a privileged class that now lives in a seaside suburb, but should I have remained where apartheid wanted me to? Yeah, my my takeaway from all of that, I mean, was a, I won't give away too much because it's all in the book, but it was a very hectic experience. Um, and it was, I was burdened by a sadness and I still am if I think about it too much about how the, the feedback I got or rather the anger and resentment and canceling that I faced came from people who were from my same communities or race or cultural background or heritage or whatever, but they had absolutely no idea and they weren't, willing to have a conversation or find out so the sadness was that they were telling me who I was in the same way an entire system of segregation told us who we, we were for years and years and years and they were claiming or, or rather like forcing an identity on me or forcing a race or a personhood on me um, and it just made the takeaway still so sad for me to be like the divisive system and the apartheid system has penetrated us so deeply and so systemically that to this day, people younger than me even are exercising that same muscle of um, fitting into a box or segregation without any mindfulness about economic migration or the Group Areas Act or what people had to do in some instances even change their names to stay in certain places. You know, they're exercising that muscle without even knowing that they're doing it because that is the impact 
of a system that was created for us to eat each other in. And when I wrote that piece, that is exactly what happened. We, we ate each other. And I just, it was frightful because I sat back and I thought, after all these years, the system still wins. And we're none the wiser. One of my favorite uh, short stories of yours involved pockets and the patriarchy. <laughs> um, you seem particularly passionate about that. Because I don't know where to put my phone. <laughs> you know where to put your phone? I don't want to spend extra however much a handbag costs. Like, you know, I want a good pair of jeans with deep enough pockets that my phone can go into that aren't like this fake, weird little stitched on market type thing. Like, what is that about? And I've had this conversation with people in the fashion industry and all of them are white men. And I'm like, guys, none of your reasons are valid. You know, they'll say stuff to me like, oh, it just costs more. But I'm like, okay, but men's pants are cheaper and they have pockets. My toddler is a three-year-old. He has pockets on everything. He has pockets on his T-shirt. I'm like, bruh, like, what do you have to put in there? It's just because you're a boy. So now you have like, you know, pockets. I feel completely passionate about it. And I think the history of it is so interesting and so, so, so telling. And it still, it haunts me that to this day, we are replicating this non-pocketness of the days of yore, which is the only way I can explain it, where women were thought to sort of not need their hands for anything, you know? So that, because that what it, that's what it comes down to, right? When you have a pocket, you have somewhere to put your phone, like I say, somewhere to carry a weapon, or somewhere, you know, you don't have to be holding a bag and have one hand empty or, you know, whatever. And it comes down to like functioning and denying women their service in society in the mere fact that we use our hands to do things. We can do things. Monetary exchanges are not the sole propriety of men. Business deals are not the sole propriety of men. Handshakes are not the sole propriety of men. You know, we need our hands. Give us our hands. Like we're, we're not living in the Victorian era where we're just... I don't know, like not allowed to do anything. Like, you know, come on patriarchy, get into the season of, you know, of the story, you knew in the last season. Um, and you mentioned your toddler. Uh, your book has some very good advice for parents and you give very concise and hilarious sorts of parenting guide. So what's your reflection on those who say everything in parenting is rosy? You're a liar. Anyone who says that to me, I will upfront call them a liar and be like, you are lying and you will have a more fulfilled life and better sleep every night if you just take five minutes out of your day, have a good cry and, and look at yourself in the mirror and go, this sucks, what the hell have I done? And then go to bed with your heart full of love and wake up and start again the next day. <laughs> <laughs> um going to something a little bit less rosy the unrest of july 2021 it was super terrifying and shocking that literally unfold, unfolded right before our eyes um even today you know we reflect on that time and we ask the question why but in your book you ask why what and when can you tell us more about your feelings about what happened back then um i think I think that the song title that I mentioned succinctly, you know, describes my feelings about it. And it's just an open-ended question, isn't it? Because I talk about the song, same thing, you know, like, um, why are we here and what have, what have we done? Um, and I think that is a question that all South Africans must strive to answer every single day. Um, I don't know what the answer is. Um, but we need to ponder deeply on, on that question to avoid the breakdown of our, our, and the destruction of our societies and our systems and economics by our very own hands. There is a story in your book, Here's the Thing About Being a Woman, which I think has a very important message for any human being. And it came about after the harassment of a 16-year-old girl by a man which you witnessed. Can you tell us briefly about what happened and what you now want to see happen? 
we're always hearing as women to see something, say something, you know, and it's such a, oh God, it's just become like this, you know, days go by, say something, see something, say something, see something. But the, the honest truth is we never do. Eh? And that's not, I think, our fault. I think it's because we need to ask the question, who do we say something to? You know, and if you if you read the the news or if you read the stats or if you're in any kind of gender activism or anything like that, which we all are by default because we live in the world, right? Um, we see the stories of how people have nowhere to go. I mean, sure, they're calls to action, but like the statistics about people, about women actually saying something are so low and for such a big variety of reasons. Like if I tell the cops, what are they gonna do? You know, if I tell my family, it's gonna be embarrassing. There's gonna be a big team blaming. I'm gonna feel ashamed. I'm gonna feel embarrassed. Um, and then on the outside of all of that, when you see something happening, like I did with the taxi incident, you go, okay, there's a woman being harassed. Something's happening. This could evolve and into something much worse potentially. Although it doesn't really need to, because it's bad enough as is. Um, but I'm also a woman, so now I've got to think about what is going to happen if I get involved. You know, what is going to happen if I say something? Am I going to take this incident home and say something to someone else? Because then I'm hopeless also. Like, again, I'm going to go, what's the point in that? So in that moment, I was just like, the people we have to say something to are the people who are making the transgressions and those are men. We have to step up to them and we have to face them and we have to say, no, not today, not here, not now, and not ever. And the biggest takeaway I took from that, that day, and maybe I was just lucky that day, is that in the face of the public in that situation, that man was powerless and he could do nothing if I said something and he didn't, he couldn't, all he could do was leave. And that was a very, very, very valuable thing to take away from that. And it, it comes with a little bit of recklessness, I think, because yeah, maybe, maybe he wouldn't have cared. Maybe he had a knife or a gun or, you know, whatever. But I think we need to really come face to face with the cowardice of men in certain instances where we've given them too much comfort to act um, and we need to make them uncomfortable in, in public spaces as women. You also write about Women's Day being pointless. Can you just briefly tell us why? Because honestly, if I have to see another invitation for Women's Day to attend a conference or a talk or a tea or a meeting, for women, by women, on Women's Day, I will, like, I will, a brain cell will burst, like I will have an aneurysm or something because you cannot shift the needle on women's rights or awareness about women's rights, whether it's gender equality, whether it's equal pay, whether it's um, violence against women. You cannot shift that needle by getting together in a room, in a corporate environment or government environment or whatever, once a year for a couple of hours with like messaging going out and women talking about women. It's just not gonna happen, you know. Um, women's Day is every day and it's not women who should be speaking about it, it's men. So I would like to see a focus group daily of men sitting on round tables being educated about women speaking to themselves because I shouldn't have to do that work anymore. There is also a short story about cancel culture and you do wrestle with it a bit. I mean, you talk about Bill Cosby and Michael Jackson and why you couldn't separate the art from the artist as compared with Woody Allen uh, and Roman Polanski. Why was it easier for you to cancel, so-called cancel these two black men? I think because in the view of my world, black success is a possibility for me. To see black artists, or black writers, black filmmakers, whatever, to see them do well and be successful and, and progress and see their work have impact and meaning um, carries a lot more weight for me and bears a lot more resonance in, in my personal 
reality than when a white person does it, you know, because we're so used to that. We've had to watch them do it like our whole lives and we're so outside of it. And so it's almost not like relatable. You know, I can't relate to it because it's not, it's never gonna be me. But when it comes to people like Michael Jackson or Bill Cosby or Nina Simone or um, Alice Walker, who is now currently being canceled for a whole bunch of other stuff, you know, whatever, like that, that touches me personally because I'm like, I looked up to you. Your life is a, almost like a, like a pseudo reality for me because I could be in whatever thing I'm engaged in, whatever it is, you know, I could be as good because if you can do it, I can do it because we're the same in many ways. So I think that's why it is contradictory, but that's why it was easier for me to cancel Bill Cosby and, and Michael Jackson because they always say when you really care about something, that's when you react. And I think I really cared about them. So I had a hard reaction towards it. Um, and I really cared about their art and their work and the meaning and the worth of it all. You write that for a Black woman, silence is death and your advice is choose violence what do you mean by that again I'm not gonna like I I, I want to just make clear that um we always box into the angry black woman trope you know um and it's because we're never heard and we're always stuck between two worlds we're like say something for the greater good or back yourself or back a people or whatever um, or stay silent and go to sleep at night knowing that you were just another cog in the wheel of a system that keeps turning and doesn't see you, you know, doesn't recognize you. And then what do we do when we don't get heard over and over and over and over and over again? It happens so many times. We take the bait, right? We take the bait and we lean into the angry black woman stereotype and we shout because what other option do we have? If we're not going to be heard, we're going to shout. And it is more humiliating for us to lead into that stereotype than anyone will ever understand because we know who wins in that situation and it's not us. But the corner is so big and dark and engulfing that there's just sometimes, no matter how heightened your awareness of the situation is or what it's gonna make you look like, sometimes there's just no way out of it. And when I say choose violence in that chapter specifically, I don't mean lean into the angry black woman stereotype, but I just mean, like the quote says, you cannot say you are at peace if you aren't capable of great violence. And in that instance, the great violence to me is to back yourself, to speak up, to say something, to be wise enough to pick which hill you are going to die on. And to be aggressive about what you stand for and how you're willing to be treated or not treated. Because I come back to Serena Williams all the time. If the best athlete in the world in her lifetime has broken every single record and been challenged over and over again, and to this day is the most tested for steroids, et cetera, in the athletics arena, completely by surprise and by absolutely no reason, if she has to wake up, and choose violence every single day as Serena Williams, then who the hell are we? And we should be doing the same. You also write about your annoyance at the notion that black leadership and politicians find their so-called obsessions for nice things by taking advantage of their power. Why does this notion irk you so much? I, was, I use that as a, as a, um, as a base point to, to open the argument with, right? because that is who's in our faces the most. And if you work in a newsroom, that's who gets the most commentary. Oh, he's wearing a watch. Oh, he's wearing those clothes. Oh, he's a politician. He shouldn't be driving that car, whatever. And yes, there's a massive, massive, you know, corruption problem in South Africa, which I am totally against. But if you're wise enough to the ways of the world, in South Africa especially, you will see it happen in real life. I mean, there will be an ordinary Joe who happens to be a black man driving, a fancy German car or whatever. And the first thing people will say is, oh, it's because you got a tender. Oh, it's because he's a black diamond. Oh, you know, like whatever. Without turning the, the lens on themselves and going, 
okay, I don't drive that car, but I also like nice things. But here's the difference. I'm allowed, you know, I'm allowed because I'm white and I'm entitled to it. And this has always been my life, but they're not allowed because then it's flashy and it's new and it's posing or, you know, whatever the case is. And I'm just like, bro, I don't care because also you created the capitalist system and I just have to live in it now. So that is, those are the cards I've been given and I'm playing my base hand. And at the end of the day, when I walk out of a door in my sloppies or like barefooted or and in a hessian sack, because I think it's cool, I get a very different response than if a white person does it. Because you tell me who I am before I get to tell you. And so if I have to look good every time I walk out of my door and wear whatever is in my means, to let you know who I am before you tell me, then that is exactly what I'm going to do. And I have no problem with that whatsoever. Lastly, Haji, in 2020, you caught COVID and your long COVID symptoms lasted almost six months. There is a line in your book where you write, I have started to feel stupider and stupider and more inadequate every day. And I think it resonates with many of us who have and are still suffering, you know, with long COVID symptoms. What was that time like for you? And what have you learned from that experience? Um, I still have very, very severe um, and very annoying uh, long COVID symptoms or consequences, I guess. Um, and all of them, funny enough, are language related. I can't recognize a pattern or there's no way to tell when it's going to happen. There's no way to gauge it. There's no way to explain it. Um, I lose my words. I've zone out I will start talking completely off topic I've never had a stutter but stuttering has become really really bad for me in certain situations and yeah I do feel humiliated and completely stupid because my whole job is words I'm still trying to figure out how to deal with it and then I've had a lot of panic attacks especially in situations where like I'm on panels or speaking to clever people or you know, whatever the case is where I just have to leave and have a panic attack because I'm not just like, I don't know how to control this. I don't know what to do or how to do it or whatever. But my, my, the biggest lesson I learned from having basically been bedridden with long COVID for 23 weeks um, and now living the rest of my life with it, I guess, is that I don't ever want to pick up that much weight in my life ever again. <laughs> so that's my biggest takeaway. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> that was columnist and author Haji Mohammed Daji here to discuss her book, Here's the Thing.